Good evening. My name is Jack Leonard, and I would like to welcome you to the fifth in the lecture series associated with our spring semester Master, Master of Landscape Architecture Interdisciplinary Studio, 100 Year Coastal Resilience Studio, Hampton, Virginia. I hope that you enjoyed our last guest lecture in the series, Kelsey Brooks, who presented Beyond the Shore Community Engagement and Equity in Coastal Resilience Planning. If you missed Kelsey's lecture or any future le lectures, you can watch them on the SAP YouTube channel. Our guest lecturer this evening is Scott Kanaki. This evening, his topic will be Economics of Coastal Resource Management. Scott Kanaki is the director of the MSU Pearl with expertise in environmental and natural resource economics. Recent projects include a regional economic impact analysis of oyster reef restoration and a large scale survey of recreational boater preferences and expenditures. Scott received his PhD in fisheries and wildlife with specialization in environmental and natural resource economics and formerly was a natural resource damage assessment expert for the US Coast Guard. Please welcome Scott Kanaki. Thank you, Jack. Hello, everybody. All right, let me uh, share my screen. Hold on. Wait a minute. All right, I just want to get it all set up. All right, should be good now. Can you all see this? Yes. Excellent. All right. So going to be covering a fair amount of ground here. Um, I suppose uh, the general kind of approach for these has been to uh, hold questions until the end. Uh, that said, please feel free if you feel so inspired and need clarity, if that's OK, Jack, that they could um, pop in in the middle. Yeah, um, or po post questions to the chat, and we can either okay. answers go along, or uh, after you finish, we'll go back and, and review all the questions. Sure. In the chat. OK. All right, so this, uh, this presentation here is titled Economics of Coastal Resource Management. Um, I've chosen to take a pretty uh, broad approach here. What I'm gonna do is uh, just really just start from square one with economics and a little bit of background. I, I don't suspect that many of you all have majored in economics and many of you may not have taken an economics course. So, want to get us all on the same page, um, highlight some different techniques and methods used by economists, especially methods and techniques that are used to understand uh, values associated with ecosystem services and environmental amenities. Um, after kind of the, the background on the economics and then some of the techniques, we'll then get into a couple uh, research projects that I've led. One Jack already mentioned, which is the Regional Economic Impact Analysis of Oyster Reef Restoration. Also uh, give you some background and some uh, details on another project looking at stream restoration uh, for the purposes um, of restoring native trout species and other benefits as well. So so it's gonna be a, a tour here of economics. I hope to keep it uh, fun and light and interesting. I hope you take away a couple of things from this. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll get started and I plan to get started, but that's how these things work. It's not, it's not moving. I'm not going to a new, new screen here. Oh, there we go. All right, a little bit of a lag. Okay, good, all right. So back to basics, what is an economy? I mean, it kind of sounds self-evident, right? But it is worth a little more uh, exploration and a deeper dive in economy or economics. It's not, it's not just money or business or the stock market or these types of things that many people think of initially when they hear the word economy 
or economics. So an economy uh, is a network of producers, distributors, and consumers of goods and services in a local, regional, national, or international setting, right? So you have producers, uh, and the producers in the act of production Really, the activities, as it says here, that determine the quantity of goods and services produced and the way in which that's carried out, uh, technological and managerial approach, right? Uh, then you have distribution. How are those goods and services divided up amongst individuals, groups, and societies? And then ultimately, they get to that end point, and it's consumption, the final utilization of those goods and services. So this is an economy, and these are the players in an economy. Um, so macroeconomics is big picture economics. The word macro means, or the piece of the word macro, economics, macro means big, macro means large. It's the branch of economics that deals with the structure and performance of the uh, broader economy, right? And we're talking about the, the types of um, measures and metrics that you see on the front page of the Baltimore Sun or the Washington Post. Uh, what's in unemployment like? What about gross domestic product? Uh, fiscal stimulus or monetary policy and interest rates are rising or falling. So these are macroeconomic measures. Uh, you can see on the right in that green box there, this is just some blurbs, uh, probably pretty standard, what you might see uh, on the front page of a, new, a newspaper or more likely website now, right? Uh, so, so that's macroeconomics, it's big picture economics. The micro, I'm a microeconomist, so of course I'm biased. I like microeconomics. It really looks at the interactions between economic agents, namely buyers and sellers, people and businesses, and how they use scarce ends to achieve desired objectives. So you really have two branches of micro. You have producer theory and consumer theory. Uh, producer theory or production economics really starts with firms or companies and them making choices and allocating scarce resources such as labor or capital investments in order to maximize profits, right? Firms are assumed in economic theory to be profit maximizing entities. Um, consumers are doing something quite similar. They're trying to maximize something as well in economic theory and consumer theory. And what they're striving to do is maximize utility. Utility is a catch-all word for going to feel good or happiness. And you know, so people have, just like firms have limited resources, people have limited resources. And maybe that's all so evident for, for, for many folks, but we don't have an unconstrained budget. We face a budget constraint. We also all face the, time, the same time constraint, really, which is 24 hours in a single day, right? So you have constraints, time and money, and then you make choices to maximize utility. All right, looks like Kelsey Brooks is joining us. Okay, cool. Um, Did I get muted there? I don't know what Five happened. Five seconds. Okay. <laughs> All right. All of a sudden, my is sticking again. Sometimes this seems like these slides are sticking. So, all right. I'm going to take you through a macroeconomics example of some of a tool that uh, economists use to understand the broader economy. I'm going to spend a couple slides on that. Uh, and then I'm going to take you through a tool that microeconomists, if you will, or economists use to understand 
uh, the interactions between uh, economic agents better, especially how people engage with the natural environments and get utility and benefit out of that. So sticking with the macroeconomics, for example, uh, right here, this is something called a regional economic impact analysis. This is an analysis on how some course of action will affect an economic system, will affect it in ways such as total output, economic output, which, which is analogous with sales, all right? Will affect employment, will affect income, both business owner income and employee income. So those are these relevant, met these economic metrics. These metrics are both, uh, they can be at any level, but there is a, a uh, spatial dimension to all of it. It's either, it could be at the city or town level, it could be the county, it could be the state, it could be the country. And what this does is track these expenditures and how they move throughout an economy so they finally filter out of that economy and move into the broader economy that's beyond the region of interest, right? Um, you see in the right green uh, little box here, uh, I don't know if you all have heard this or seen this. It's received a lot of um, promotion. If you follow MSU Announce, those, those email blasts. But Morgan State University has an economic impact, according to a recent study, um, of $1 billion statewide. That's at the state level. And $640 million in Baltimore. That's at the regional level or the city level, I should say. So you got one billion in statewide output, six thousand jobs in the state, and five hundred and fifty-eight million dollars in wages or or income. Um, sometimes economists honestly have to take a little bit of a deep breath when seeing seeing studies like this because we're not talking about we're talking about spending, we're not talking about value generation or value creation in the way that. Uh, economists, when they talk about consumer surplus and producer surplus, uh, the, the, that is valuation economics. This is tracking the spending and respending of dollars. So conceivably, one could pay people a lot of money to dig ditches and fill them back up again and generate regional economic impacts. In this particular situation with Morgan State University, uh, those, you know, the state of Maryland pays for as a, pays for employee salaries and a lot of other uh, aspects of the university. So there is something interesting about state funds being used to support the university, which is all fine and dandy, and then us counting that as an economic impact. So uh, in general and much broader, many economists don't think that the way to get wealthy as a society is to spend money poorly. And you have to really think about how that money is being spent. This doesn't speak to anything about whether those are wise investments. You could build the biggest skyscraper in the world and employ tens of thousands of people, but is that a good thing? Does that increase social welfare? These are all things that one should be thinking about, especially you all, when you're thinking about um, doing coastal projects that are going to generate regional economic impacts, and that's going to excite a lot of, you know, excite politicians and policymakers. But just keep this in mind. Maybe come talk to me if you have any thoughts. But it's not, it, it's something to, to be aware of, that we're spending money and tracking the movement of that throughout the economy. And it doesn't address the question of whether, Benefits are greater than costs, which I'll get to in a moment here. But one more, one more slide on regional economic impact analysis. I've already talked about this, but you have four measures at the top there. The direct effect in that green box, that initial pulse of money, right? And then the indirect effects are that next level, next stage spending of that money and both direct and effect, direct effects and indirect effects produce induced effects, which are people spending money that they earn. Jack and I take a salary from Morgan State University. 
and then we spend that money in our community or beyond, right? So each of those four measures has a direct, indirect, and induced effect. And the total effects, which is that $1 billion figure for sales that I showed you in the previous slide from Morgan State, is direct effects plus indirect effects plus induced equals total economic effects. Okay, so lesson number two, benefit cost analysis. And this is where, of course, again, I'm, I uh, am a economist who is specialized in microeconomics. So this is, is much more interesting to me. I think it's in many ways more valuable. This is a tool used to understand economic efficiency or otherwise known as the net economic benefits of different policy alternatives, different approaches. The US government actually mandates this whenever there's a federal regulatory action to understand what are the benefits and costs, the net economic benefits, the benefit cost ratio. And you can do that through a benefit cost analysis. And this is used to make, and in, to, I shouldn't say necessarily make, but inform public decisions. And it's done from the standpoint of society rather than a single organization or entity. So, you know, a benefit, here's an example. Taxes are a transfer. They're not, they're not a cost. So the way that they would enter, they wouldn't enter into a benefit cost analysis per se. If my taxes go up, someone out of that money is transferred from me to somebody else. Re scarce resources are not used, and therefore it's not classically, in economics terms, a cost. Okay, so I hope that's clear as mud, but there's a difference between expenditures and costs, and cost in economics economist terms necessitate the use of scarce resources, something that has a value somewhere else, right? Not just simply transferring money from point A to point B. Okay. How would one do a benefit cost analysis? So if you are proposing a coastal resilience project or something of the sort, you'd want to specify clearly the project or program describe quantitatively the inputs and expected outputs of that program. For example, an oyster reef restoration, which I'll talk about in a bit, though ironically I do it in a regional economic impact context and not a benefit cost context, you would look at the inputs, material and labor and the costs of those inputs. What are the outputs you get? There's a restored reef. Maybe there's enhanced fisheries, there's habitat, there's nutrient cycling, water purification, water filtration, et cetera. Then you, number three, step number three, you'd estimate the aggregate social costs and benefits of those inputs and outputs and compare the benefits and costs, right? So at this point, we've gone over a couple of techniques, one macro, one micro, one macro being a regional economic impact analysis, and the micro technique being benefit cost analysis. Both have uses and, and appropriate uses within the context of coastal resource management. Uh, and uh, let me get more into the benefit cost. There's some more slides here. And economists can be a little bit annoying. We, we often uh, have very precise meanings for words that many people think are just kind of a general term. One example is benefits. So that's an ordinary word. Economists have given that a technical meaning. It, it, it applies being made better off, but I'm going to tell you what economists mean when they talk amongst each other. When they talk about benefits or net benefits. So, but before we get there, what are benefits? What do we think of when we think of benefits? Well, benefits, they're conferred when somebody gets something that they want something that they value. So what is that? How do you know if someone values something? Well, we can observe how people make trade-offs to get that thing they value. So they're willing to sacrifice, they're willing to pay for it. So here's another technical term that economists use, it's willingness to pay. 
So the value of a good is what somebody is willing to pay for it, right? So you might hypothetically, uh, let's say you're in the market for a new car, all right? And you buy that new car, it costs $20,000 or $25,000. Is that your willingness to pay for the car? Well, no, that's the price you paid for the car, but maybe you would have paid 26,000 or 27,000. And your willingness to pay depends on several things. It depends on your budget constraint, how much money you have to spend on a new car. It depends on the quality of sub, the different types of substitutes. Maybe you're looking at a Subaru um, and there's you know comparables in Ford or GM or Honda or Toyota. So it depends on all that. And the less, the lower your budget constraint is, more binding it is, and the fewer substitutes, all a sequel, you're going to be willing to pay more for that thing. You have, have a higher willingness to pay for that. And benefits is synonymous with willingness to pay when economics are talking about economics. When economists are talking about economics. All right. So moving from the benefit cost and transitioning to how we estimate values or benefits and willingness to pay for ecosystem services, right? So the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, defined ecosystem services as the benefits, small b, not big b like economists use, right? But small b benefits the people obtain from ecosystems. So I put people, I, I italicized it, I put it in bold, I put it in all caps, I underlined it, and I put it in yellow highlighting. And the reason why I did all that is because many people get confused about what ecosystem services are and that's just something good that's in the environment. And no, that is not the correct way to use it. Um, economists pick a lot of nits on this. It's a service. And service by service, it means service to people to society, right? There's different types of services. Provisioning services are that direct use. If you're eating some eating salmon or tuna for dinner, that's a you know product of the ecosystem of the ocean, right? So that's part of that's food. Um, there's other products, of course, as you can see, uh, that are pretty obvious. I think we use a lot of them, uh, you know, fresh water and fuel wood or fiber. Is regulating services, another type of service, water purification, uh, climate regulation, the service that trees provide to help regulate temperature and climate in local or, 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 or larger areas. Um, and then there's cultural services. So uh, a big part of that, well, I mean, there's a number of parts of it, but the part that I focus on in my research is recreation, outdoor recreation in particular. So people go hiking or camping or skiing or canoeing or whitewater rafting. They are, uh, those are cultural services. They're engaging in the natural environment in that context, right? And at the bottom, there is uh, all the supporting services that support all of these other services, ecosystem services. So, all right. Willingness to pay. We're back to that term again here. Willingness to pay for ecosystem services. There's two types of methods to estimate willingness to pay for ecosystem services, broadly speaking. Revealed preference methods and stated preference methods. So if you were going to make a change to some coastal region and do a new project, you might use both techniques, revealed preference and state of preference methods to estimate willingness to pay or the economic benefits associated with the new site, the new amenities of that site. So in a revealed preference is just like it sounds, individuals reveal their willingness to pay through observed or reported choices. It's the gold standard. You're not asking somebody a question about what they'd be willing to pay for X, Y, Z. You're observing their use of that or second best, but generally good enough is maybe asking them in the survey, how many times did you go fishing? How many times did you go camping? 
that type of thing, right? So you know they're revealing their willingness to pay by through their choices, right? The travel cost method is a method I'll talk about in a bit. It, is, it estimates willingness to pay through the trade-offs people make to drive further in order to uh, keep going back to the recreational fishing context. And you, <laughs> I won't stop probably throughout this, uh, but uh, you know, to catch a bigger fish, to catch more fish, right? You might drive further. Uh, spend more money to have that experience. Hedonic pricing is typically typically used in property uh, to to understand the the at the, the values associated with characteristics of a piece of property. So if that coastal restoration project that may create an increase in property values because people now have a new place to say go to recreate or just to see it, the, the visual, the uh, viewscape has improved. So you can isolate that by, you know, fairly sophisticated uh, statistical techniques by looking at sales prices of properties as a function of the characteristics of that property, right? Prop like a home, for example, would be bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, acreage, and you hold all those other confounding things constant, and you try to attempt to isolate the effect of that, say that new project, that new viewscape, that restored area on the sales price of homes. Okay, so that's hedonic pricing. Averting costs, um, there's a lot of ways you, you folks would do that, economists would do that. A good example is, <clears throat> Uh, people working dangerous jobs uh, and say to be a uh, like a crabber, someone that goes on, to, excuse me, someone that, uh, that is a, a, a crabber or fisher that risks, um, you know, life and limb. They're engaging in a dangerous occupation. All I'll see, well, that person needs to be paid more to work that occupation than an education with a similar required skill set that doesn't have that dangerous hazardous component to it, right? So these are all revealed preference methods that economists would use to estimate willingness to pay for ecosystem services. Stated preference is a real, you know, and I've done both in my research career, and I continue to, to use both in my research. State of preference can come under a lot of criticism because you ask people questions and then they tell you how much they value it. And now there's sophisticated ways to try to get around the hypothetical bias. It's real easy to say if someone asks you, well, how much would you pay to protect polar bears in Alaska? You might say, I don't know, I'd, I'd pay 50 bucks a month, I'd pay 20 bucks a year. Talk is cheap. You're responding to a question about your willingness to pay to protect something. You're not revealing your um, valuation of that good. In that scenario I just described, is called contingent valuation. So you ask people how much they'd be willing to pay. Sometimes you would present a number, like would you be willing to pay $50 a month to protect polar bears in Alaska? And you might say, you'd say yes or no. And then there would be another follow-up question. Maybe would you pay $30 a month? So um, these state of preference methods and a choice experiment is, is, is a similar method. I won't get into all the details of that, but they rely on hypothetical responses and they come under a lot of criticism. There's been a lot of hand wringing over that, especially a place like NOAA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration actually had a blue ribbon panel on contingent valuation, whether it should even be considered when valuing aspects of the natural environment. And their conclusion was yes, if it's done very carefully. So, yeah. All right, let's move on. I want to touch on this real quick, and I already touched on it. It's, it's costs versus opportunity costs. I just want to remind people, like I said before, I already got to this, a little ahead of schedule, but expenditures are not costs. If you, if you go down to the third bullet, if you have a situation, and the way this is framed here is that if a, a bike path 
they want to, there's going to be a new bike path, and that's going to be put on an old railway right of way that's no other alternative use. But the community has to pay the rail, railroad a hundred thousand for the right of way. That is not an opportunity cost. There's no scarce resources used that had another use, right? So that's the nature of opportunity cost. Is usually is as it says in the the, the first bullet. The opportunity cost of using resources is the highest value those resources would have been they would have been produced had they not been used in the matter under consideration, right? Now, don't get me wrong, that cost to the community is a cost and a serious one and a, and a barrier to doing the project potentially, but in the aggregate and a benefit cost uh, approach as economists refer to benefit cost analysis, that is not part of the cost, right? That's a cost to the community to do something, but not a cost to society, to public, right? Okay. That's your Econ 101, little Econ 201 your review. Um, and now I'm going to get into two case studies that uh, are really two research projects that I've used, uh, that I've done over the last several years. One macroeconomic, one microeconomic, uh, one regional economic impact, one more in a benefit cost analysis context. One that focuses on oyster reef restoration and the other one on acid mine drainage remediation for trout angles. Okay. Pause real quick and grab a, grab a swig here. So this was a team effort. Um, and often in these types of projects where you're trying to understand how some restoration effort creates a series or sequence of effects that generate benefits to society that can be monetized, you start from this change, right? There's a change in the environment. In this case, there's a change in the structure of the environment. There is a oyster, a restored oyster reef where there was not one before. That new structure has a function it provides habitat it increases fish abundance nutrient cycling then you make that transition into the human realm so we're in the physical realm the biological realm gets the service so when like ding 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 it's like that's the human realm right increased fish harvest from the functions the change because of the structure right and then you monetize that service, in this case, through commercial fishing revenue that I'll, I'll show you here in a bit. Okay, so oyster reef restoration in Maryland. Um, it's uh, a costly endeavor. It's largely federally funded. Almost 900 acres have been restored in the Chop Tank River system, which is on the eastern shore of Maryland. Three sub-tributaries, Harris Creek, Tread Avon, and the Little Shop Tank. Um, costs a lot of money. It's been politically contentious. The watermen, the commercial harvesters in the Bay don't like it. They think it interferes. First of all, like areas have been put off limits to oyster harvesting. But even beyond that, they say that's, that it has affected negatively affected crabbing because of the devices they use to catch crabs get tangled in the restored reefs, right? So our question was, well, what are the different ecosystem, ecological uh, changes, and then ultimately human kind of source or related ecosystem services that are generated through different levels of oyster reef restoration, right? And that's the three scenarios you see here. There's a no reef scenario, a young reef scenario, which is really where we are right now, and then a mature reef scenario. And each of those scenarios, each of those environments and food webs produce harvests or landings that then can be used to understand what the economic outputs are in terms of jobs and sales. Remember, this is a, this is a regional economic impact. 
And this is a horrendogram, <laughs> also known as a food web model. I don't know if anybody has seen this. I hadn't seen this until I started working on this project. I teamed with um, an ecological modeler who was able to handle the front end of understanding how oyster reefs affect the food web and the natural environment, right? So I developed this complicated, and it looks complicated to me, and it is complicated, food web. And in that red oval, the oysters and associated filter feeders were manipulated. And then we could see how uh, the, that changed uh, different fish species abundance. And especially at the top, these different um, you know, types of gears are used to harvest commercially valuable fish species such as striped bass or croaker, white perch, and also crabs, blue crabs especially. So harvest predictions. We found the mature oy uh, oyster reef uh, will support a large increase in blue crab, 80% relative to the young reef and 160% relative to the no reef scenario. And that's that was a real powerful finding because partially because of the stakeholder conflict involved here, right? Uh, the crabbers did not like these restored oyster reefs, despite the fact that they continued to try to set their trout lines very near the reefs, presumably because of the effect of these reefs in producing more crabs. So uh, there's also uh, a an increase in white perch and negligible. Uh, change the striped bass. We have through the model an estimate of harvest. I won't go through this entire slide, but you convert har we converted harvest to sales using some assumptions that are probably beyond the scope of this uh, of this conversation here. And then when we have converted harvest in pounds to sales in dollars then put that into a regional economic impact model called Implan that estimates how those fisher expenditures, they have to spend money to harvest fish, right? They have to pay their employees, they have to pay themselves, they have to buy bait, they have to buy tackle, they have to repair their nets, they have to pay for their boat, et cetera, right? How that circulates throughout the regional economy in the Eastern shore until it finally filters out of the economy, right? So what were the findings here in terms of just revenues, whether you're looking at comparing a mature reef to a young reef or no reef scenario, you see the figures there. Those are annual figures between 4.5 million and $11 million in increased dockside sales of commercially uh, harvested fish and crab species, right? That was kind of move a little bit quicker through some of this. And here are those metrics I told you about, those economic metrics that are used in these regional economic impact analyses. You have sales, labor income, value added, employment, uh, and then a comparison between a young reef and mature reef. So what we found at the top, the top square, and if you compare the mature reef to before restoration even started, we're talking about $23 million in annual sales impacts to commercial fishers and associated industries in the regional economy because of oyster reef restoration. So this really does speak, speaks the language of many politicians and policymakers that are always hungry, seems always hungry to understand what the economics are of these investments because you could talk about how great it is that oysters are restored but they cost 57 million dollars to do that there's a lot of different benefits from that restoration we only looked at a small slice of it and the economic impacts associated with it okay quick break now i'm gonna take you about another eight to ten minutes here and then we'll do our questions and all that. We're gonna move from the macro, from the regional economic impact analysis to the micro, to the benefit cost analysis. And really, in a lot of cases, all the action or most of the action is on the benefit side. 
and not so much on estimating costs because the costs tend to be pretty obvious unless you're dealing with a tricky situation with taxes like I described earlier, right? Um, but we looked at the net economic benefits, the economic benefits of acid mine drainage remediation to trout anglers. This is a very serious problem. Uh, you have these abandoned mines. It's throughout the mountain mountainous areas of this country and the world. It's especially problematic in the Appalachian Mountains. I think it's about 8,000 kilometers of stream are degraded from acid mine drainage when, as it says here, the water table rebounds in these abandoned mines and you have acidic, metallic water. It's real nasty and orange typically, and it poisons these waterways. And I'll get to some of the, here's some of the effects right here. The effects are well documented. Macroinvertebrates and fish uh, are severe, can be severely affected. It dramatically lowers the pH of the waterway. Um, and in many cases, you almost have a bi biological desert, really. A fish cannot live in, in, in highly degraded uh, waterways. Um, negative effects to humans as well. We're going to explore one of those with recreational fishing in this study here. So here's a map of AMD or acid mine drainage in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, Pennsylvania's got a major problem with it still. West Virginia has a major problem with it. Uh, as you can see, Western Maryland is not, um, it's just the, the small part of Maryland that is in the Appalachian Mountains, but there's still about uh, 453 steam, well, before AMD remediation, there was about 450 stream miles affected, 270 miles in the Potomac River Basin, and it caused some very serious problems, especially in the north branch of the Potomac River, which forms the boundary between Maryland and West Virginia. They have these big concrete structures called limestone dosers in many places that the stream water runs through the limestone and it neutralizes the acidic water. So it raises the pH and the fish um, can come back and you know survive in the stream and, and, and other animals as well, of course. So there's 10 of these dosers on the North Branch Potomac River or the surrounding watershed and system of water bodies. Before you had these, you couldn't go fishing in this water. You probably wouldn't want to put your foot in the water. It was a very um, toxic water body, frankly. Touch on the cost of this a bit. Um, the total cost estimated to fix the problem in Pennsylvania is about $5 billion with a B. So it's a major problem in West in Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia. I don't have a total cost to fix estimate, but they do estimate the cost of restoring a watershed at about twenty million dollars. Such a small piece of their problem. Mayor, the state of Maryland un undertakes this, um, and almost ex well, the large part of that five hundred fifty thousand dollar figure that you see at the bottom of the slide here is operations and maintenance costs for limestone dosers to keep places like the North Branch of the Potomac fishable, swimmable, and drinkable, right? So the research objective for this part of the project, uh, for this project, is to estimate the economic benefits or willingness to pay associated with AMD remediation in North Branch of the Potomac to Maryland trout anglers. So. Yeah, I'll keep going. I'm just going to take a tangent, but it's probably ill-advised. We use the travel cost method to calculate economic benefits um, in this case, and often with outdoor recreation generally. And we just look at how people make choices, where they decide where to go fishing in this context, uh, what their travel costs are, vehicle operating costs, and their the opportunity costs, their time, which is included as well. And then you can estimate willingness to pay for having more fish, bigger fish, or even having a water body available to fish in. So here's a kind of boring way to show this. You have a decision process. An angler can decide whether to take a trip or not. And if they do decide to take a trip, where do they go? And each of those streams would have characteristics, the number of stock trout, the amount of uh, wild trout that live in the stream, both brown trout and brook trout in the case of Maryland. 
but here's like kind of a more maybe it's more intuitive this is angler the angler person on the left is deciding where to go fishing one site's 20 miles away one site's 50 miles away well if you didn't know anything else you might go to the closer site right what if there's a lot more rainbow trout at that site at the bottom well maybe you decide to drive the extra 30 miles and go there well what if the site that has 20 miles also has large brook trout, right? So um, this gets at the trade-offs. Anglers are making trade-offs between travel costs, fish that could be caught, the size of fish, the quantity of fish, the types of fish. And then you use survey data to estimate a model that predicts where people go as a function of those characteristics. So. Kind of wrapping up here, I won't get into too much of the, the, the gory details of the modeling. That's no fun. Uh, so I estimated the net, the economic benefits for trout anglers from a net, uh, north branch of the Potomac River that can be fished in relative to what would happen if it was eliminated, right? So if you eliminated the north branch of the Potomac as a viable trout fishing site, the reduction in economic benefits is about $850,000 annually. So this, we're actually in the final stages of, of developing this manuscript before we're gonna attempt to publish it in the Journal of uh, Environmental Management. Um, so contrasting that with the annual operations and maintenance costs of 550,000, it's, that's powerful right there. I mean, this is just a small sliver of presumably a small sliver of the economic benefits associated with restoring this water body. And there's benefits to property owners that live on or near the water body. There's benefits to whitewater rafters, kayakers, um, other folks as well. So th this is 850,000 is not a total economic value. It's just a small piece of the pie of that total economic value the value that trout anglers have on the on the um, effectively the restored water body through the limestone dosers, right? So that's a whirlwind. Um, we're at 550. I don't know if that's too long, too short, probably not too short, but I hope you all learned something and I hope it's generated some questions for you. I'd love to talk economics, especially with people that are maybe not that are not economists that are kind of just getting into this world for the first time and thinking about it. It has so much relevance for how we spend, you know, what ultimately is a limited amount of money to improve our environment and how economists have a lot to offer, I think, and how we can spend that money effectively by doing things like benefit cost analysis. Um, and, and regional economic impact analysis plays a role too. I'm not as always in, as enthusiastic about that for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Scott. That was pretty informative, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of the people listening, a lot of the students, especially uh, who have not come from any kind of economics background, um, I think this adds a big piece to what we're looking at because. You know, as we study sustainability, one of the main legs of sustainability is economics. And that seems to be, in my experience, one of the hardest things for somebody to wrap their head around is the economics of sustainability. So I think um, I think your approach to start looking at these uh, eco services um, and their value, uh, I think is really beneficial when we're trying to look at developing um, your know, long-term resilience and sustainability in communities. Um, if everybody would like to post uh, chats or if we don't have a lot going in the chat, just to go ahead and, and ask your questions and we'll try to do it in a somewhat organized fashion. Does anybody have a question to start with? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, it's not explicitly about coastal resources, it's kind of a development question as well, but so this was a question that came up a lot when I took um, history of city and regional planning last semester and like kind of looking back to the origins of landscape architecture and 
city and regional planning in the U.S. and park development. Like there's this, you know, pattern of we build a beautiful park or a landscape somewhere and real estate prices go up around that area and the original residents get priced out. Um, so I guess I'm just curious what your thoughts are as an economist about how do we create landscapes that are valuable that don't price out the residents or communities around them. Yeah, boy, is that an interesting topic. You know, I, I just didn't have enough uh, time or slides really to go into, you know, some of this like equity and fairness and it's all considerations that are really, that are very important. I mean, benefit cost analysis has nothing to say about equity. It's just about, you know, aggregating costs and social costs and benefits. And, but that's, that again, that's, that's efficiency. That's economic efficiency, trying to find the greatest net benefits. But equity is always, is inherently more fungible and who, whose, whose concerns need to be heard, how to prioritize different groups, what extent to prioritize those groups are inherently more subjective, right? Um, people bid up. I mean, this is a classic example of people, in your example, of people bidding up the price of real estate to live in an area. If you, if you, you know, when you, if you put something better there, people are going to bid up the prices of real estate so that they can live next to this thing that's better. That's just, that's, in, to get around that is, I don't know that it's, it's possible per se, gosh, but it should be considered. And I think it's more of a, on societies. It's like our, you know, you might argue that it's, it's like a political decision on how to compensate folks through its taxation or other means for people that are negatively affected. And, you know, the, some of the previous residents that are homeowners will now can sell their homes for more money. So they would benefit, but they have to pay more taxes if they don't sell their homes, the values increase. So that's bad. But what if the area doesn't have many homeowners, it's mostly renters? Well, then they don't get any of the benefits. That's not fair. Right. So, it's a really interesting topic like, and it, the incentives of people to like live near desirable things is like, and to, to pay more for homes. We all kind of do it when we decide where we live, like, well, is there something nice there? It, you know, you bid up the rents, you bid up the prices of homes because it's a desirable place to live. And it's, it's really, that's, that's just part of the economics that think, you know, how society handles that is, is kind of on the political side. Yeah. If that makes sense, you know, but just my observations on it. Yeah. Thank you. A great question though. And really very timely and relevant with a lot of the things we're thinking about nowadays. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I have a question too. Thanks sure. for the presentation. It seems mm -hmm. like uh, a lot of the examples that you gave of um, restoration projects informed by environmental economics had to do with maybe like a, a government, local government as, as the, the client, the one in charge of making that decision. I'm wondering, are there examples of environmental economics being taken into account in the private realm, um, you know, as a decision-making tool, do you think that environmental economics has something to offer there? Or is that, again, um, more uh, of a political domain up to governments to, you know, require compliance? Hmm. All right. So I think I know what you're getting at, more or less. <clears throat> the area that I would, and I didn't, I actually cut a slide last minute that spoke more about non-market valuation. So in, in a consumer's utility function, I'm going to get a little nerdy here. A little, I can bring my, put my economist hat clearly on right here. But uh, we have a utility function and we get, we make choices to buy things or services in the marketplace. 
But then there's this non-market thing that we get benefits and value from too, but we don't choose that. Society like chooses that. It chooses chooses it through projects like the acid mine drainage or some other like big project. We don't have the ability to choose those things. So that's why the focus is on kind of these projects in the public domain is because they're they're inherently like it's a social decision to provide a public good that for reasons is underprovided, right? Because people are, you know, they're not, this is another branch of economics looking at public goods and why they're underprovided is because people, you know, don't donate to things that they prefer to spend the money on something that benefits just them versus like donate to like a nonprofit that's going to build a new park, for example. Those are notoriously hard things to do. Like someone else should pay for it. I'll still get all the benefit, right? That's the problem there. So so that's the reason why I'm focusing on on that public domain area is because it's, you know, understanding how to spend taxpayer dollars most effectively is really has a big part of environmental economics. And it's, it's so, so critical because we, we don't have, we can't make those choices ourselves. It's a group choice and we need to decide as a government, government will decide whether to do it or not. And benefit cost analysis, for example, can inform that decision. When you talk about the private sector, maybe I'll throw the question back at you real quick. The private, what do you, what precisely do you mean? Are you talking about corporations and their decisions or, or what? Yeah, kind of like, I mean, an example would be a developer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a private entity that would have tremendous influence over the quality of land. Mm -hmm. And is there a place for environmental economics in offering solutions to problems that might be created by something like that? Or oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, is, so, yeah. Well, go on. Sorry, but I'm already excited to give you the answer. Now I see where you're going. Um, you would, you could you would impose a fee like I mean, like either like carbon emissions tax right these are things that you hear about and are discussed to to force innovation to solve like um, you know the emissions problems right so if you tax like the undesirable you know the opposite of a good in economics is a bad if you tax the bads you're gonna get less bads. Right. So that's that's where there is a role in like carbon taxes is, is a great example and something that's being discussed now, um, which would help to solve environmental problems, potentially with climate change. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I have a question if nobody else wants to jump in in, in your reef restoration calculation were they based on like so much per acre, the benefits or um, so much per volume or length of a reef? How do you determine mm -hmm. uh, that impact? Um, and can we apply it to say, you know, we have, we can put in you know, a thousand linear feet of reef and that's worth so much, but if I only put in 200 linear feet, it's got a different yeah. you know, out, out, outcome. Right, right. So in our in our situation, we modeled approximately 900 acres of restored oyster reef in the Chop Tank River system. That doesn't mean you just take that number and divide it by 900, right? It's non nonlinear in that way. And you'd have to really talk to the ecological modeler because that, you know, he he's the one, my colleague at the Pearl, Tom Eide, uh, he's the one that developed the food web model that is the basis for this. And frankly, like in that particular project, all the action is on that front end, developing the food web model. Once I have the harvest, then I multiply that by the dioxide value per pound to get the total revenues, feed it into an implant model to get the regional economic impacts. It's pretty boilerplate for me. His part was the heavy lifting, and there are nonlinearities. Um, I think, like it's to get not get lost in the weeds of that is kind of is important. Whether it's twenty three million in annual economic impacts, or nineteen million, or twenty seven million, really the point is, is that there's a there could there should be, and we predict there to be a lot 
there to be a large economic impact to have large increases in blue crab in this area in the chop tank river fishery uh yeah so but yeah whether it's you know breaking it down to the acre level you could divide it by 900 but you'd be you'd already be compromising what you're doing you know now i'm guessing it's more of a logarithmic type function you know there's a critical mass and there's mm -hmm. a minimum that if you don't do at least this much there's really right to benefit and that would be interesting because let's mm -hmm. say we have a small area it's like doing uh living shorelines on one property when nobody every else is bulkheaded is you get much benefit with yeah. you know, 100, 100 feet of living shoreline mm -hmm. uh you mm -hmm. know how much reef do you need before you actually start seeing a benefit yeah sure sure especially on a scale where you can like you know notice like commercial fishing harvest increases too right and also i'll add on that uh you know we didn't explore in that in that rest reef restoration analysis we did not explore fisher behavior change in terms of like people coming in from outside the region because there is an increase in harvest so you know these ecological economic models have a lot of action potentially there and that's one of the things we just we had to punt on because we really couldn't predict how that would induce people to come in and, and fish and then maybe fish that population down potentially too right so just another another challenge on that project so we did have one comment uh, question in the chat i don't know if uh, laurel you oh know, can just uh, well, I can. Uh, I'm, I'm unmuting. Um, so, Scott, in often we hear, you can read it in the chat, often we hear um, the phrase used in design schools, a design intervention. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the word intervention is borrowed from economics, but it's used a lot in design schools. And I'm not so sure that folks, in, you know, that are using it understand the how the word intervention is used in economics so could you just clarify for us how is the word intervention used in economics <laughs> well you know that when you say intervention i i do mean an intervention you, you must be talking about just like in a market like what in a market in a yeah market. You're yeah. probably, you, I don't know which economist you're talking about, but uh, are you talking about interventions to correct like a market failure, perhaps, or? Just not? to, well, it's, yeah, to not necessarily a failure, but intervening in a market in such a way that, that something would be provided that otherwise, if left oh. to its own devices, the market mm -hmm. wouldn't sure. Yes. Okay. Well, that's okay. Well, there I so just no that's great and that, that that is what it what you're referring to i wasn't entirely clear but the market produces outcomes um and those outcomes may not be socially desirable they may be politically undesirable right so government will intervene in a market in a way say to redistribute right well uh, this kind of the way the market allocates quote unquote allocates well it's not it's not fair etc right so government will you know we vote for, for these types of policies and these are things that people think about when they go into the voting into the the, the ballot booth the voting booth right uh is whether that the market is doing something that whether we could intervene in a way that would move the resources around so that certain people are better off so that society is better off etc so um yeah i think economists sometimes get pegged as just being like free market like that's all that matters is just it's, you got a market you get out of the way and, and that's just not the case um you can have a you can have a situation that has very high this very that is very high net economic benefits is economically efficient and be like thoroughly disgusting right from like a humanity perspective right we get <laughs> it could be a project that makes mark zuckerberg one billion dollars richer but takes like one million dollars out of the pocket or say ten dollars out of the pockets of everybody else right is that and then if there's a positive 
you know, that benefit is it's economically efficient. Nobody would think that that's good or right, right? So then, anyways, just another example on that front. Yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks, Laurel. Appreciate it. More questions. Well, I have another one then. Of, All right. Uh, how do you assess the economic value of health impacts or benefits in all of this, like whether public health or individual yeah. health? Well, benefit cost analysis is used all the time to do that. Um, yeah. So you can look at people's um, averting behavior to spend money to protect themselves against environmental disabilities. Uh, if people think that the water or know that the water that they drink and out of their home is not safe, they would spend money on bottled water, for example, to protect themselves against that perceived or, or real risk, right? So that's just, that is one example of averting behavior, averting costs, um, and just changing behavior to avoid that risk, right? And this is another area where economists can get themselves in a bit of trouble because they can sound cold and callous about, well, because the question is like, well, what if someone can't afford that? What if they can't pay for that? So there are real serious equity considerations. And when you start monetizing aspects of human health and their willingness to pay to avoid a harm, which is done all the time, and you want to Google the va a value of a statistical life, you know, check that out and you can see you know, there are actually statistical values placed on a human life that could range between three and ten million dollars. And those types of um, values are used to understand how much we should spend, we being the government, for example, should spend to reduce mortality, say like in automobiles or in or some other facet of our life, right? Because again, it's a world of scarce resources. You can spend money to reduce mortality, reduce, you know, the government can do that, but what is the, you know, what, what, you know, trying to, by comparing apples to apples, by monetizing benefits and having, mon you know, monetary costs, you can then make a direct comparison between competing policy objectives or initiatives, right? And that can sound very, it can pe make people very uncomfortable. <laughs> I can recall conversations I've had at the Pearl. People that that's that's unethical. Well, I'm not an advocate for it, but I am an advocate for understanding how you know that this is that we need to understand how to effectively use scarce resources uh, to save lives. And you know, this is one way to shed some light onto this into that matter. It should not be the only way by any stretch. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate that question. More questions. Sa There's questions out there. Sa Sami, do you got any questions? See you hanging out. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. How, how are oh, you doing? I'm good. I was in a meeting, so I entered late. And oh. uh, lots of questions. <laughs> lots of questions. <laughs> so uh, you may have covered it um, mm -hmm. in the part that I missed out. Um, Access to water, again, it's an issue that mm -hmm. is, uh, um, it's an equity issue, something that I've been working on for a very long time. And um, now that uh, we have uh, a full focus on equity issues, how do you reconceptualize the role of economy in making water accessible? Yeah. Not just to the people who are able to come to the waterfront, but mm -hmm. also who are not. Sure. Well, you know, I've, I've actually published a lot in the area of um, public access for outdoor recreation. We should write yeah. a proposal, Samia, and go after some funds and to do some cool research on that. Uh, the reality is the waterfronts are desirable places to be and to live and to play. And you have people that pay are willing to pay a lot of money for that waterfront amenity. Like, I mean, it can be 
50% or 70% higher uh, amount to pay you would pay for a home, the comparable home that's on the water versus that same exact home that's, you know, 300 feet or 200 feet away that's not on the water, that doesn't have access. So, so that creates a challenge because the prices are bid up. So it becomes very costly to acquire waterfront property to provide access for people, right? That otherwise wouldn't have yeah. it. And it's a noted challenge in the Chesapeake Bay and people are really starting to, you know, look at it. And if you want people to save the bay, care about our aquatic resources, our, our natural environments and water-based environment, you really need to, it really helps to get people on the bay or near the bay or to see the bay and to experience the bay, like in Jack's picture right there uh, behind him with the kayak and the, and the Bay Bridge. So, um, yeah, it's, it's challenging because people want to live in the waterfront and they pay a lot of money for those homes. And then to, if you, even if you want to build a small new park on the waterfront and you're, you're chewing up the lot, you know, five to 10 lots that people could have homes on, that's going to be some pricey real estate. So it really is a matter of governments, as Laurel kind of put it, intervening and saying, hey, we're going to spend some money here and we're going to acquire this property and make that a priority so that people can access the water. Yeah. So you're talking about that there has to be a will. Um, I think uh, there's another thing to be considered with the climate change and the water rising, at least in cities like Miami, there yeah. is a there is a climate gentrification that's happening. And now the highland places are becoming, which used to be the less um, um, valued uh, places are now becoming more value and the waterfront is losing its um, uh, economic viability because um, mm -hmm. of the very high insurance um, mm -hmm. that goes with it. Yeah. So as these things are reversing, I think it is a very important time yeah. to consider waterfront in relationship to the yeah. watersheds so yeah. that the water can actually become accessible not through the waterfront, uh -huh. but also through the watersheds, how to make the watersheds mm -hmm. accessible. Right. And if, if yeah. uh, neighborhoods become custodians of watersheds, then also mm -hmm. the waterfront becomes much more cleaner. So I think there's an mm -hmm. ideological change that's happening that needs, to be, um, that needs to be really thought of in terms of a holistic, um, it's a holistic paradigm shift moment. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'll make one quick comment on that. I'll just pick something that <laughs> what you just said that uh, you know I feel strongly about uh, is the issue of insurance and 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 subsidizing frankly in many cases people very wealthy people typically like living on the waterfronts um, if people had to pay the full cost of their insurance or the risks they face living on the waterfronts they, they might not live there. They might, yeah. the, it yeah. might not be quite as high demand to live there. And then there might be more access for people that say aren't like wealthy and can live on the waterfront. Right. But we, you know, we rush to aid people that they live in like multi-million dollar homes. And of course we should protect their lives, but the question is about their property and incentivizing them to live in places that are highly vulnerable to like severe weather events is not, not a real effective way or just way to proceed, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it, it goes back to the issue of, uh, you know, too big to fail. Just like the banks get uh, bailed out by taxpayers' monies. Uh, yeah. When a waterfront property goes down in a storm, uh, it's the taxpayers through FEMA that actually outsource mm -hmm. that uh, rich person who's living on the waterfront. So. All of that mm -hmm. needs to be completely rethought and uh, mm -hmm. repackaged through economics lens. So mm -hmm. it's I'm yeah. glad that you are sharing your thoughts with architecture and design and landscape architecture students. Thanks, Samia, for your thoughts. Appreciate it. More questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you for this lecture. So I'm just curious, thinking about for our studio project and the properties that are waterfront, 
um, would it be like economically viable for the city to buy waterfront properties from people that are of properties that are going to be affected by sea level rise the worst or it could be used um, say for like stormwater management um, or I don't know just curious how that works with the city buying back property would they I mean is that even a viable I don't know is it viable could be. I mean, it, I guess it depends on the city and their priorities and uh, the real estate costs uh, and what, yeah, what the benefits would be. I mean, it could be benefit cost analysis, right? There's maybe there's a million dollars that could be spent to buy up a couple properties uh, that could then be turned into some kind of natural shoreline or something along those lines. So that's your cost. Well, what are the benefits? And uh yeah, so it really depends on the situation. So, uh, and to the extent that those properties are beginning to be compromised by sea level rise, their values are already lower. So, the, the, the you know, a, a city probably sh in the situation that you described should probably start by acquiring, I would think, properties that um, values have decreased because of the sea level rise problem. And they could be acquired for, for much cheaper because people don't want to live in an area or in a house is being routinely flooded, for example. Yeah. Whereas that place could have like, you know, in the absence of the homes might have a nice boardwalk or a nature area or something like that for the whole community. Yeah. Thank you. More questions. I know, Scott, I, I think what you presented tonight is a good, probably jumping off point for a lot of people because the complexities, and I know you've had to skirt a lot of the complexities here, um, but what a lot of decisions come down to is the economics. And, yeah. and no matter how much we want to talk about the social aspects of things or the environmental aspects of things, especially in our society, the dollars tend to do the talking Mm -hmm. And the more we can understand the economics of the decisions we make as designers, as ecologists, as um, people working in the social realms, the stronger our arguments will become. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that we, that we learn that because of the, you know, what you were talking about, the decisions people make, in a lot of respects, are economic. Now, health comes into play at some point because as they say, if you don't have your health, you know, you don't have anything, but beyond that, basically we're making economic decisions every day. You know, mm -hmm. What do I eat? Where do I go? Mm -hmm. Recreation? What kind of house do I live in? Where, what neighborhood can I afford to live in? All those decisions mm -hmm. are, are yeah. as economic as they are anything else. They all involve trade-offs, and that's at the heart of economics is trade-offs. We can't have everything we want. We live in a world of scarce resources, and hence there must be trade-offs. I mean, that's economics is not about money. It's not about the stock market. That's the heart and soul of economics is scarcity uh, and you know necessitating trade-offs, right? <clears throat> as, you, as you were talking about waterfront, that was always the issue. I would say you can't anymore really make new waterfront. You know, so it's, yeah. it's a very limited resource. <laughs> you can't go out and create new oceans to create new beachfront yeah. communities. You know, the beach is there. There's only yeah. so much of it. And if we've restricted uh, for environmental reasons a lot of that or public access, those pieces that are left over become extremely valuable mm -hmm. to those who can afford to, to pay the cost. Yeah, you know, and I mean, it's not only like how many miles of waterfront, but the type of waterfront, of course, too. And it varies so wildly across Maryland from the western shore to like eastern shore salt marshes and uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, Maryland has 3,000. For those, <laughs> if here's a fun fact, Maryland has 3,190 miles of shoreline. More shoreline uh, relative to other area of a state. Um, yeah, in the entire country. So, our, our ratio of uh, yeah, shoreline to state area is the greatest in the entire country. Uh, 3,190. So there's a lot of shoreline on the eastern shore of Maryland, but it's all, I mean, it's tough. That's not, it's salt marsh, Phragmites marsh. It's becoming increasingly inundated because of sea level rise and land subsidence, as most many of you know now. Um, so the areas where you can build a nice home are, are, are limited. And those are also areas where you can build a boat ramp. Or, so, you know, that said, there are areas on the eastern shore to increase access um, it's just, it's also far away from population centers, right? So that's a problem too. It's, it's good in the sense that it keeps the real estate prices down somewhat, but people can, you know, they can't access it as quickly as they could like a place near Annapolis, but that that's really expensive land. So lots of, lots of things just in a web here makes it, make it real challenging. I think it's a really interesting conversation, if I may add to it. I think it's, again, a paradigm-shifting moment. And we have to start kind of um, questioning the previous paradigms, the issue of scarcity. Yes, the, the natural resources are scarce. We all know that. But how much natural resource does one need? And what defines scarcity? This is a moment to really rethink that. And this whole uh, direction that um, uh, urbanism is taking, the alternative urbanism is taking with the um, uh, scarcity of food and how that is really a scarcity of mindset. It is so easy to grow your own food. And then once you start growing it, and I've experimented myself in my own house, once you start growing cucumbers and tomatoes, you have abundance and you share it with your neighbors. So it is really a moment when design students need to not think of the paradigm of the industrial revolution that annihilated the environment through the mindset of scarcity because it pillaged the nature and think of abundance as a new paradigm and think a little broadly of what constitutes the privilege of being on water. The waters are rising and the beauty of it is that when the water rises, you can bring it in. So perhaps instead of uh, landscape urbanism, we are thinking of seascape urbanism. So we are scaping the land to allow the water into the land wherever possible so that you can have waterfronts where there weren't any. So this is really a paradigm shifting moment, especially if you're going for a design competition. I would suggest students to think out of the box and think of the uh, mentality of abundance. How much do we need to survive? And then all of a sudden, um, economics becomes the historic economics from the polis of the Athenian democracy, where economics meant managing your resources in an ethical way. Boy, that's uh, very articulately said, Sami. I appreciate your, 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 your perspective and thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have to push back a little bit on, on some of that. Um, and just, it's not even really pushing back. It's just, it's going back to trade-offs and, and, you know, the industrial revolution and, and the massive increases in human well-being that occurred during the indus industrial revolution came with the costs. It came with the cost of damage to the natural environments. And, you know, the, the great success that China has had in developing its economy, maybe one of the fan, most fantastic, fantastic success stories in all of humanity is raising hundreds of millions of people in China out of poverty through developing their country over the past 20 to 30 years. It used to be a a peasant a kind of agrarian country and it's a dynamic world power with an economy greater than ours in the U S and 
but the account comes at costs, environmental and, and, you know, climate change, carbon emissions. So the, and the question of where to draw the line is going to be different from everyone. And I know Kelsey Brooks is on the line here. I see her name there. Uh, she talked a lot about community in the most recent, the previous lecture. And, and economists do start with the individual and what an individual's preferences are. And this not saying it's good or bad or that they should be changed or not. It's just understanding them, that humans have wants and needs and seek to achieve those wants and needs through, you know, their time and money. And, and in some cases, objectively, perhaps, yes, they, they should have different wants and needs. And if we all were more respective of the natural environment, it'd probably be a better place. But remember that humans have come a long ways in the last hundred years and more from the industrial revolution. And it has been good for a lot of people, but it has come at very serious environmental side effects that we're now just beginning to understand. It's a really complicated situation in my, in my view. But anyway, Sami, just wanted to respond to that, but thanks for your thoughts. No, thanks, I mean, I agree with you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, since since Scott, <laughs> both my name, I guess I, I do have a bit of a question for you, Scott. I will I will put in a, a quick plug for the resilience framework we talked about um, during my lecture, uh, right? Which took into account this idea of timelines. Also, over what time scale are people benefiting, and over what time scale are people suffering? Which I think is a really interesting question to ask around climate change, because right, absolutely, you could say during after the industrial revolution, people have benefited, but what if like the next 500 years people yeah. will suffer as a result of climate change and like on the whole, what are we looking at? But the, the question that I have, and maybe this is a little far afield and I, I know we probably don't want this class to turn into you and me, I'm just talking, <laughs> is that concept of willingness to pay doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Like that comes from somewhere and people's willingness to pay for something is, culturally based, it's based on norms that could shift. Mm -hmm. Any component of the analysis that takes into account either intervent intervention <laughs> at that level or you know, shifting that and, and what it might take to shift that willingness to pay. Okay, let me quick respond, quickly respond to your, your first point on the time, and that is something that economists really struggle with, uh, is we call it discounting is the, the technical term that we use for that. People prefer, and it basically boils down to you prefer having a thousand dollars today than having a thousand dollars tomorrow. And now if you'll know you're only gonna le live another day, your discount rate would be a hundred percent because you wouldn't even care about having a thousand dollars tomorrow, hypothetically, right? So how you, especially in these situations like climate change where you have long-term negative consequences that are becoming increasingly understood but are still on to some degree uncertain and how you even what is an appropriate discount rate for something like that is you google um just search for uh discount rates in climate change and you could just you know, <laughs> really go down a rabbit hole there and what people use and they use a range of rates and, and within the context of these benefit cost analyses. Uh, so and I got off on a little bit of a tangent, Kelsey. Could you could you remind me on the on the, the, the second question again? Yeah. So the the question of willingness to pay and oh, yeah. not mm -hmm. being um, I guess an entirely independent variable. Right? Yeah. Thank you. So it, you know, it comes down to pe people, economists make a lot of assumptions and it's to, we do that to make our models tractable, but uh, people have preferences and they're stable. They're stable preferences. And that's an assumption that can be very well critiqued. I can tell you my preferences have changed throughout my life and people may have preferences for changing their preferences even, right? For growing and becoming someone different and better, right? So willingness to pay assumes stable preferences and and on most of economist models assume stable preferences and that's a you know many economists are beginning to ask these very questions and explore this i mean you really sound like you're on the leading edge of uh, <laughs> some new and exciting research in economics to you know 
look more at culture and look more at how beliefs change and preferences change, even, and, you know, even though it makes our models very difficult or impossible in some cases, if we assume that preferences are not stable. So but excellent point. And it's a new area of research, not new, but growing or increasing to understand how, um, you know, culture and economics are intertwined and it really is important and powerful. And thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. It's interesting to hear it's, it's growing. Uh, Well, any more last questions before we wrap up? Well, I'd like to thank you again, Scott, for what I thought was extremely important and informative. And I know you'll be available. Uh, I'm sure the students will come, come up with questions as we're working through their particular um, problems and, and design solutions they're gonna come up with to try to address the economic piece of it. So uh, appreciate your availability and, and continued support. And uh, as everybody knows, if um, you want to catch up on lectures that you missed, you can go to the School of Architecture and Planning's uh, YouTube page. And next week, our guest speaker will be Michael Esbon uh, from the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and he will be discussing and presenting aquaculture landscapes designing for coastal cohabitation. So I think we've had a, a great series. Scott, you really put a, a good an economic um, focus on something that's not always addressed as part of what we do. And uh, so I thank you for that. And uh, thank everybody for participating. And I look forward to seeing everyone at the uh, guest lecture next week.